Hi, and welcome to another edition of Jules Voto's Photo Focus. In this video, I'm going to be giving you tips on how to get the best possible quality, whether you shoot film or if you shoot digital. And I've narrowed it down to six categories. So uh, let's get started, and we're going to start with ISO or film speed. Okay, so if you're shooting film, you have a lot of choices. And the best quality is usually obtained with a slower speed film, such as if you're shooting slides, Fujichrome Velvia, which is a speed of 50. If you're shooting black and white, Ilford Pan F, which is also a speed of 50. If you're shooting color negative, a good one is Kodak Ektar 100s. Now there are others, there are plenty of others. These are just you know examples of a few that I have shot. Now back in the day when I was shooting a lot of film back in the 70s and into the 80s, if I wanted the highest quality black and white and lighting conditions permitted, I would shoot Kodak Panatomic X, which was rated at a speed of 32. And if I wanted the highest quality when shooting slide film, it would be Kodachrome 25. So why does such a slow speed film give you the best quality? Mainly because of grain and sharpness, and you could enlarge them much more than you could with a higher speed film. Now with digital, it's much of the same thing. The lower the ISO, the less noise there's going to be, there's better sharpness, and you have greater dynamic range. Now most digital cameras today start out at an ISO of 100. However, several, I know some of the Nikons, you can go as low as an ISO of 64. And with that low ISO, you're getting no noise at all. You can enlarge that image greatly if you need to. And also, your, again, your dynamic range is great, especially good for landscape photography. Now, that's not to say that you can't use higher speed film. We're just talking about getting the best possible quality. You're not going to use an ISO 50 speed film if you're shooting sports, especially indoor sports. S uh, same thing with your digital. You're not going to set your ISO to 64 if your camera has that capability if you're shooting action. So that's something you know, important to keep in mind. And one other thing concerning ISO with digital cameras, uh, example, the, the Nikon D810 or D850, go down to 64. But you could also set it lower than that. However, that is not recommended. There are extended ISO available on many cameras at the low end and at the high end. I suggest you stay within the native ISO range of your camera. Okay, so number two, the second category we're going to talk about are lenses. And to get the highest quality, you want to use your best lenses. You want to use a prime lens, if you have it, over a zoom lens. Not to say that zoom lenses are bad. In fact, today's zoom lenses are amazing. When I first got interested in photography in 1970, ooh, uh, probably one of the best zoom lenses was Nikon's 80 to 200, but it was an f4.5. And still, the fixed focal length, the prime lenses were better. And even today, with these great zooms that we have, some of them are very close to a prime but the Prime still has a little bit of an edge, has less elements in it usually, less prone to flare, lighter, so it's easier to hand hold. So not to say you can't get great pictures with the zoom, but if you want the absolute best quality, go with the Prime. The other thing is most lenses are sharper 
a couple stops down from wide open. The old rule used to be shoot at two to three stops down from wide open. So for example, if you had a 50 millimeter F2, it would be suggested that you shot it at F4 or F5.6. And uh, I think that still holds true today, although even wide open, today's zooms and especially primes are just pretty amazing wide open. So shoot a couple stops down from wide open if you're looking for the best quality. Now we'll get into focus and a little bit about depth of field in a little bit. Also, make sure your lenses are clean. Okay, make sure that front element is clean. Use a blower brush, the rear element, blow off any dust with the rear element. Do not use compressed air. Use one of those blower brushes. Use a lens shade, especially if the sun is in the image somewhere, you're shooting into the sun or the sun is just out of view. A lens shade goes a long way towards reducing flare. And if you're using filters, I always have a filter on my lens to protect it. Uh, make sure you use good quality filters. But the lens shade really works to help cut down on flare. Not going to eliminate it entirely, but it's a big help. And it's an inexpensive accessory to have. And many lenses today come with a shade, so why not use it? Okay, number three is focus. Be very careful with your focus. Focus accurately. There is not much you can do with an out-of-focus image. Even you bring it into your computer and you try to sharpen it up in Photoshop or some other editing software, it's not the same as getting it right the first time. If you're using a manual focus camera, Usually they have either a micro prism spot in the center or a rangefinder spot. Again, just focus carefully. Don't rush. And if you're lucky enough to have a camera that has interchangeable screens, such as this Olympus OM-1, use the appropriate screen for the lens you're using. For example, if you're shooting with a wide angle lens, wide angle lenses are more difficult to focus than normal or or telephoto lenses using the micro prism spot. But the split image range finder, all you need to do is find a straight line somewhere and just bring it together in the range finder spot and you'll be in focus. So uh, that's a nice advantage of a camera that has a split image range finder spot. Now continuing with lenses, let's just talk a little bit about depth of field. As you probably know, if you focus at a given distance, let's say 10 feet. There's going to be a certain area behind, further away, and closer than 10 feet that will be in acceptable focus. The more you close your lens down, the more you stop it down, that zone of sharpness, that zone of depth of field increases. Generally speaking, you have approximately one third of the depth of field in front of that focus distance and two thirds behind. Now many cameras have a depth of field preview button like on this Olympus here. So you can set your lens let's say to f8, press that depth of field preview lever or button and observe on the screen that area of sharp focus. So if you're photographing something, let's say a landscape that has a lot of depth in it and you want everything to be in focus, you're going to need to use the smaller apertures and don't focus on that distant mountain. Focus on something closer because as you now know, you're going to have more focus behind than in front. Okay, one more thing is as you stop a lens down, as you get to those small apertures, yes, you get more depth of field, but you lose sharpness. Lenses are not as sharp at, let's say, f16, f22. You never want to use those apertures. You may sometimes in macro photography, but you really want to try to avoid that. Because of diffraction, because of that small lens opening, you're not going to get the definition that you would at stops two to three stops down from wide open. Okay, our fourth category I'm just going to touch on briefly is lighting. And lighting is very important to a photograph. And let's say you're photographing a landscape. 
If the sun is in the picture somewhere, that could make for a very interesting picture, but it also can cause flare. As I mentioned earlier, always use a lens shade. And that softens the image. It lowers the contrast, and the image doesn't look as sharp. So you got to be careful with lighting. So how your subject is lit is very important. If it's lit from the side, for example, if you're taking pictures of a person outdoors and the sun is hitting them on one side of the face, well, that side's going to be well lit, it's going to be nice and bright, but the other side's going to be in shadow, making it very difficult to get a good image. So be observe the lighting. For example, let's say you're going to your son and daughter's soccer game and you want to take some pictures. Look for the side of the field where the lighting is the best. So you don't want to be shooting into the sun. You don't want your, your son or daughter backlit. Okay, so get yourself in the right position with lighting. There's a lot to lighting. Even indoors, if you're photographing someone in front of a window, well, don't shoot into the window. Put the window behind you, and that'll give nice, soft light to the subject. All right, the next category I want to talk about is exposure. Exposure is very important. Today's cameras with segmented metering do a great job, but they're not perfect. And if you're shooting film, you don't want to underexpose, at least if you're shooting color negative or black and white film. If you underexpose, you're going to increase the grain, you're going to have little or no shadow detail, and there's, much, there's not much you can do to improve that in processing. If you're shooting digital, it's kind of the opposite. If you're going to err, err on the side of underexposure as opposed to overexposure. If you overexpose too much, your highlights are going to be blown out and have no detail and be very difficult to recover them in your editing software. So exposure is important. Use a handheld meter. A lot, if you're shooting film and you have one of these old manual focus cameras that the meter don't work, and a lot of them don't, the cameras from the 60s and into the 70s use CDS cells, and a lot of times the cells are dead and the meter won't work. Fine, the camera's still fine, especially those mechanical cameras, because they don't require a battery. They only require the battery for the meter. So get yourself a handheld meter or use one of the apps that for your phone and you'll get better results than just trying to guess. Now, the last category I want to talk about is also very important. They're all important, but this one especially, I think, I think it's an area where a lot of amateur photographers kind of mess up and it's support. You're going to get the best results if you use some type of camera support, a tripod, ideally. Now, you cannot always use a tripod. When you're photographing your kid's soccer game, probably can't use a tripod. If you're traveling and uh, you know, when you're doing a bus tour, let's say, not going to be very convenient to have a tripod if you, with you. Many locations will not permit a tripod. Let's say you're doing landscape photography. A tripod is your, one of your best friends. Okay, so this one here, this is a very sturdy old tripod. This is over 30 years old. It's solid as a rock, but it weighs a ton. I primarily use this now just around the house if I'm doing macro photography or sometimes to support my camera when I'm doing one of these videos. This one here is a carbon fiber tripod. It's very light. It's a travel tripod. It folds up really small. It'll, it'll fit easily in an overnight bag. Okay, so here we have the Olympus mounted on a tripod. If you're going to do that, if you're going to use a tripod and you're going to use slower shutter speeds, Use some type of release, because if you press the shutter release, you're going to cause some movement with the camera. And camera movement, operator movement, photographer movement, is a big reason why some photographs don't appear sharp. Now, another thing, this camera has a mirror lockup. Single lens reflex cameras, whether film 
or DSLRs have a flipping mirror. And if you could lock that mirror up, you're going to have less likelihood of vibration because that mirror flipping up causes some vibration. So if you lock up the mirror, you focus your camera, you set your exposure, you lock up your mirror, and then use your cable release to take the picture. Okay, and when you use the cable release, see how I have it curved here? Don't hold it like this, because this could cause some vibration. Use it like that, okay? Now, with a newer camera, with digital cameras, or autofocus cameras, or uh, many cameras today, have dispense with the standard cable release, the mechanical cable release, and they have an electronic release. So if you're using a DSLR or a f electronic film camera that has a remote release, use that when using your slow shutter speeds. Many DSLRs and film cameras have mirror lockups. Take advantage of it. Use it. Of course, with a mirrorless camera, there is no mirror, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, another thing you can do if you don't happen to have a remote release, release or you don't have a cable release, you can use a self-timer, but you're not going to be able to use a self-timer, usually depending on the camera, for longer speeds than maybe a second or so. Okay, so what if you're in the kind of a situation where no tripod allowed, or you don't have a tripod, or you're traveling and you just didn't want to bother with the tripod? Well, you're not going to be able to use real slow shutter speeds, okay? So forget to half a second or one second or, or slower than that. But you also need to properly hold your camera when, when shooting. So let me take this remote re release out. Okay, and the best way to hold a single lens reflex camera, a mirrorless camera, film or digital, is to support the lens with your left hand. And your right hand obviously holds the camera and fires the shutter release. Bring your elbows in close to the body and gently squeeze the release. Now I did a whole video on holding your camera properly and I'll put a link in the description below to that video. But that is very important. Now we have something today, since probably sometime in the 90s, that I never had when I first started out in photography, and that is image stabilization or vibration reduction. First, it appeared in the lenses back in, I guess it was late 80s, early 90s, no, I'm not even sure now, uh, but so it was available in the lens. So the lens had some type of vibration reduction. Then once we hit, came to mirrorless, many mirrorless cameras have it built into the camera. And it works with lenses without built-in image stabilization. So that's a great thing to have as you get older, like me. You can't hold the camera as steady as you used to. I remember back in the early 70s when I was a teenager, I was able to hand hold the camera at a 15th of a second with a 50 millimeter lens. Now a good rule of thumb is if you're shooting with a 200 millimeter lens, make sure your shutter speed is at least a 200th of a second. So the closest speed on a mechanical camera would be a 250th of a second. If you're shooting with a 50 millimeter lens like I have on this Olympus here, set your shutter speed to a minimum of a 60th of a second, at least until you get good hand holding your camera. But if you have image stabilization, take advantage of it, use it. You can hand hold at much lower speeds if you used image stabilization. One other thing related to the support category, I mentioned using a shutter speed equal to or greater than the focal length of your lens you know, with a 50 millimeter lens, use at least a 60th of a second. And that's good for photographer movement, okay, if you don't hold your camera steady, if you're shaking. But subject movement is another thing. And image stabilization, vibration reduction will not help with subject movement. You need a fast shutter speed to stop subject movement. So if you're shooting that soccer game, 
you're going to need to use pretty fast shutter speeds, 500th of a second, maybe a thousandth of a second. Anytime there's action, especially action moving across the frame parallel to the camera, you're going to need faster shutter speeds to stop that movement. So we got to concern ourselves with us, the photographer, not holding the camera steady. A faster shutter speed will help with that. Vibration will, re reduction will help with that. But subject movement, that vibration reduction will do nothing for that. You just need to use faster shutter speeds. So in summing up, try to use the slowest speed film or ISO setting on your digital camera. Use prime lenses if possible. Stop down a few stops from wide open. Focus. Make sure you're accurately focusing, whether shooting with a manual focus camera or an autofocus. You can miss focus with an autofocus camera if you put that focus spot on something in the background, let's say, rather than your main subject. And if photographing a portrait, Make sure you focus on the eyes. Even if you're shooting with your lens wide open to throw the background out of focus, focus on the eyes. Lighting. Make sure you're in good lighting. Try to avoid shooting with the sun or a light source right in the image. It's going to lower the contrast and create flare. Exposure. Proper exposure is very important. So make sure you don't overexpose or underexpose. And if you're not sure, you could bracket your exposures. And finally, support. Use a tripod whenever possible. If not possible, use good technique when hand holding your camera. And use image stabilization or vibration reduction, whatever your camera manufacturer calls it, that will help you get sharper images. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helped you. If you have any questions concerning a Anything that I spoke about today, please leave a comment in the comments below. If you have a question, I will ha be happy to answer any questions you may have, or drop me an email. I try to respond to all emails. So if you thought this video was helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I usually publish a new video every Monday morning and Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So I will talk to you next time.